Good morning, uh, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Councilmember Francisco Moya, uh, the chair of this subcommittee, and today I'm joined by Council Members uh, Steve Levin and Councilmember Menchaca. Uh, if you are here to testify on projects on our calendar, uh, for which the hearing was uh, not already uh, closed, please fill out uh, one of these slips, uh, these white slips, and give it to the Sergeant at Arms and indicate uh, the name of the application you wish to testify on uh, on that slip. Uh, okay. So we will now start today's hearings. Uh, our first hearing will be on the pre-considered LU's 3901 9th Avenue rezoning uh, for the property in Council Member Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. Uh, 39 Group Inc. seeks a rezoning of 3901 uh, 9th Avenue from an M12 to an R7A uh, slash C24 and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area on the rezoning uh, area with MIH options one and two. These actions would facilitate the development of a six-story mixed-use building with ground floor commercial space and approximately 40 housing units. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, I, and I call up uh, Richard uh, Lobel. And hang on one second. Okay. I'm joined by Jenny Kwong, uh, who is representative of the applicant. Great. Thank you. Uh, Council, will you please swear in the panel? Um, please fill out an extra speaker slip when you're done. For sure. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you'll answer all questions truthfully? We do. I do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I now want to turn it over to Councilmember Menchaca for um, some remarks. Uh, hi. I, I have a few questions. Thank you, Chair by the way, and, and uh, we're really excited to be having this conversation as it moves through the process. I have some questions that I want to ask after the presentation, but the first thing I just want to say is uh, I know that we've been discussing this proposal for some time now, and that the, uh, the conversations have been with my staff and with the community. Uh, we brought up some, some good, good questions, but at the end of the day, the, the one thing that I want us to remind um, or that this reminds us is that you're asking the city and the people of this of this incredible uh, city to give to give you more value, to be able to build more and differently, and that has a lot of value for for you. Um, you have to meet us with very specific, and we'll go through the questions, uh, responses and and infrastructure items and things that the public is going to need as well. And so we're hoping to get to that place and memorialize all the things that are going to be helpful for us and for you. And that's, that's the goal here. Uh, and I hope we can get there. I have, every, I have every confidence that we're going to be able to get there, but that's the goal. We come to the middle and you meet us with a memorialized plan or else this whole thing doesn't work. So that's all I'm going to say right now and looking forward to your presentation and I have some questions later. Thank you. And, and I would just add, uh, Councilmember Menchaca, that um, we have had several conversations with your staff. We would say that uh, they've been fantastic conversations in um, discussing some of the items, which probably are, uh, would be uh, uh, points which we would raise and, and try to memorialize. Um, we look forward to doing that. We think it's a great project, and, and, um, and uh, the community board here unanimously supported this project, so we're hopeful that um, that on the strength of that and, and uh, further discussions with you and your office that uh, we can satisfy you, the council, and, uh, and add something of value to the local area. Great. So, um, Chair Moya, uh, council members, thank you so much for hearing us today. Once again, my name is Richard Lobel. I'm with the law firm of Sheldon Lobel, PC. I'm joined by Jenny Kwong, who is a, uh, a representative of the applicant, and we're here to discuss 3901 9th Avenue uh, in this rezoning, which is in Community District 12. So um, a, a summary here of the actions that we're actually seeking. The property is currently zoned M12, uh, which would allow for up to a two FAR of commercial and manufacturing uses and would allow for uh, up to a 4.8 FAR for commercial and community facility uses. 
Uh, interestingly, the rezoning actually is for an R7AC24, which means that from a bulk standpoint, as far as the size of the building, we actually, after the rezoning, could build less than is currently permitted under the regulations. So if a 4.8 FAR building could be built as of today, the building moving forward would be a 4.6 building. That is the maximum FAR under R7A. So uh, while the floor area does come down, the uh, uses at the building do change, as was mentioned by Councilmember Menchaca. We would now seek to do a, uh, a residential development with commercial on the ground floor. The ground floor would offer about 8,500 square feet of commercial square footage and the upper stories, which would number five stories, would have approximately 40 residential units. Um, so the two actions being sought are the rezoning, as well as a text amendment to map uh, inclusionary housing, ma mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, both option one and option two. The uh, goal of the applicant here would be to do option one, but of course, that's uh, subject to additional conversation. Um, just by way of a general background, as you can see on the map in the circled area to the top left, the proposed project area is located within an M12, um, and this district is uh, about two blocks east of uh, the border of Community Board 7, located within Community Board 12. And in the tax map, if you take a look at the upper uh, portion of the tax map, the lot in question is lot one. It's got about 100 feet of frontage on 39th Street and uh, about 95 feet of frontage on 9th Avenue. Uh, these are pictures of the subject property. The property right now currently houses automotive uses. This is a legal as of right use within the surrounding district. Uh, and this is basically uh, a use which is promoted under this district. This is used car sales. Uh, it is not a very attractive use for the area. Um, when we did go to the community board and have fairly thorough conversations with them, many community board members came up to me afterwards and said that uh, they, they wish that this rezoning would extend to additional blocks because they feel that the land use here doesn't really, isn't really conducive for this type of use, and we can talk about that a little bit further. Um, so the interesting thing about the rezoning, as you'll note, is that on the left side is the current zoning. You can see um, uh, the right side has a a uh, portion which is surrounded by a dotted line. So on the left side, the current M12 exists on the northern portion of this property, but on the southern portion of the lot and of the, of the block actually, you've got an existing R6 with C23 overlay. So as far as the land use patterns go on this particular block, you have half the block which is right now zoned to permit residential and mixed use residential, while the northern portion of the block has manufacturing and promotes manufacturing uses. This is kind of at odds with the existing residential on the southern portion of the block. Many of the, of the owners on the southern portion of the block are facing the possibility of expansion of commercial and manufacturing uses, which are not really harmonious with the residential uses immediately adjacent to them. The properties that back onto our property and the adjacent properties are almost exclusively residential or mixed use residential. So they're really not compatible with the M12 uses promoted by the current zoning. As you can see from the dotted area on the right, the rezoning would uh, essentially um, restore residential and commercial zoning to the entirety of the block so that there wouldn't be any of this incompatibility and the residential, uni residential owners on the southern portion of the block would not have to face the possibility of noxious uses. Uh, of course, we also discussed the additional MIH mapping on the property which would allow for options one and two while the applicant and its materials has sought option one. Um, just to kind of conclude the presentation and leave us open for questions, you can see here kind of a detailed tax map. The um, R7AC24 on the northern portion of the block would encompass all or parts of seven lots, including the applicant. Um, the applicant's lot would be included entirely with the rezoning. There would be an additional five lots adjacent to us, which would be majority now R7AC24, and there's one lot which would be a small portion in, within the rezoning area that would not be affected by the rezoning. But what I will tell you from the land use and from the land use patterns as demonstrated in this map are that of the five properties which are included in this rezoning other than the applicant's rezoning, one of those is commercial, but the other four have residential uses. So one of the reasons that I think the local area as well as city planning was supportive of this rezoning is that this rezoning will turn 
uh, a block frontage, which right now, outside of the applicant's property, is only 20% conforming to one which is 100% conforming. So all of these adjacent user, users and owners who have right now these three-story multifamily ground floor commercial with residential above will now be conforming in the district, which is helpful to them in terms of being able to file applications at DOB to upkeep their, to improve their buildings and to uh, allow for their buildings to be uh, go through general maintenance and repair. Um, so the zoning comparison table again discusses the difference in the zoning district, of course, primarily being the ability now to use residential use. Again, this is not a rezoning which seeks additional bulk. In fact, the bulk that could be used here would be, would be less, would be lower than would be currently permitted. And we have uh, the final slide, which is an uh, illustrative rendering. Um, so that's basically the bulk of the presentation. Uh, and uh, again, we'd be happy to take any specific questions from the council members. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. Um, so how long has the applicant uh, owned uh, the property? Approximately three years. Three years. And how did you decide upon the R7A district as opposed to other potential districts that could be higher, lower density? Um, I think the, the discussion here was centered around several factors. The first is that the R7A offers a, a bulk which is similar to the current bulk on the property. And so when city planning looked at um, the difference between a no action scenario as, as, uh, as far as what they could do now versus the proposal, the bulk of the two uh, zoning districts is very similar. The R7A specifically was chosen because it allows for kind of a modest, uh, uh, kind of a mid-range number of units here, it would be 40 units at the property. And given the fact that this is very close to uh, local transportation, uh, city planning felt that, that this was an appropriate district, for, particularly for this block. So going into the uh, number of apartments, what are the MIA bans for the apartments uh, in the affordable units? So currently there's 40 units that would be proposed at the property. Um, there would be, uh, just as far as a breakdown, there's 10 one-bedroom units and um, 32 bedroom units. Of the 32 bedroom units, six of those would be for um, uh, MIH units, and of the 10 one-bedrooms, four of those would be for MIH units. Uh, in addition, as far as the income levels are concerned, the income levels would be in accordance with option one, so there would be an average of 60% AMI with, I think, uh, a minimum of 5% of being at 40% AMI. And can you just quickly walk me through the concerns of the borough president um, and your plans for addressing them? Sure. So the borough president expressed um, several uh, concerns or um, conditions to their approval, which we uh, actually had the opportunity to discuss with Councilmember Menchaca's staff, and, and we um, can address several of those. Um, the first was with regards to a proposed food store at the site. This is a use that's been expressly um, adopted by the local area as one that's being, uh, that, that would be sought and would be welcome at the site. Uh, in actuality, we would be happy to put a food store at the site. The, um, uh, the plans and materials which have been submitted to city planning to date include a proposed uh, supermarket uh, in the 8,500 square feet of ground floor and cellar accessory space. So as far as that, that uh, recommendation of the borough president is concerned, uh, we, we welcome that. And, and indeed, we actually led the materials in that direction so that we could you know, expressly discuss that. Um, the, with regards to the bedroom mix, currently the bedroom mix is between one and two bedrooms, uh, with the majority of them being two bedrooms. As far as our experience is concerned, this actually offers a fairly healthy mix and a, a fair number of larger units. The uh, Brooklyn Borough President, as in previous applications before the Borough President, uh, requested um, a bedroom mix of at least 50% two or three bedroom uh, and at least 75% one or more bedroom affordable housing units. Actually, upon further conversation, and obviously Councilmember Machaka is here to address this, um, his staff basically expressed that they found the current bedroom mix to be acceptable to them. So we didn't really move any further with regards to the Brooklyn Borough President's recommendation. Um, with regards to the remaining recommendations, 
uh, there are there are currently planned to be resiliency member uh, resiliency measures to be built into the building. So, for example, the applicant is proposing a green roof for the property. Uh, as far as additional items, this is subject to further design and discussion, but they haven't really, um, you know, gone very much into that uh, to further design other than a green roof. Um, and as far as the uh, ability to use um, uh, a local nonprofit for the administering agent, this is something which is totally acceptable to the applicant to the extent that the uh, the um, administering agent would be a uh, an approved HPD. Uh, administering agent and is a local administering agent, uh, the applicant has said that they'd be happy to do that. They actually would appreciate the input from a local agency, so that's not a problem. Um, the, the final discussion, I think, was with regards to um, local business enterprises um, and uh, MWBEs. Um, this is something which the applicant uh, has considered. They, they're supportive of, of including that in the project. Um, they haven't really uh, come to the numbers that the Brooklyn Borough President has offered, but I know it's something that we've talked about and it's something which uh, you know, we'd be happy to, to further discuss. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for, for those questions that, that really kind of shows the continued commitment, not just of, of this chair, but this committee and this council and how we really want to uh, understand the, the right kind of mix of both bedrooms, but also height and bulk, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to follow up with a couple of the things that uh, we haven't touched on completely on, and one of them is the Vision Zero and the kind of crosswalk. I'd love to kind of get a sense um, about, about that transformation of that corner. The car dealership, um, and then transforming the car dealership to the residential, we're going to have a lot more, more traffic. That's a super high traffic intersection. The borough president has recommended a sidewalk improvement. Can you tell me more a little bit about, about the recommendations on how you plan to address that? So I think as part of the analysis, particularly the environmental analysis of the project, we got a negative declaration from the Environmental Assessment Review Division at City Planning. So we demonstrated that, that uh, the proposal would, as a baseline, be safe for the surrounding area. I think this was particularly in line with the current situation there. The car dealership actually has a fair number of uh, vehicles going to and from the property, as, would, as you'd imagine, at a, at a dealership. So um, the uh, ability to reduce the curb cuts on the site would actually be kind of an improvement to that corner. Um, but uh, I don't think that the, the applicant hasn't really explored uh, discussions with DOT as far as sidewalk improvements. I think this is something that we'd be happy to consider moving forward, um, but it's just with, with particularity, they haven't really um, uh, considered what the paving would be on that sidewalk area. We understand that it is an important corner that, the, um, that we wanna make sure that our residents and, and visitors to the local business are safe, but um, beyond that, there haven't been any per specific discussions. I think there can be some uh, specific designs, and so we wanna set up some time to talk to DOT as we get closer to the application. Uh, uh, vote. Storm water and energy is something else that we spoke about. Uh, both the borough president and I, the community, feel in general that we should be thinking about this. Um, what, uh, and we've discussed a possible commitment that you might be making to include significant sustainability measures on the roof. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how you're, you are kind of gearing up to fulfill that, that commitment specifically? Um, and the work that you're doing right now within the design uh, and financing the development? Well, I think with particularity, I could basically address the, the measures which we've um, committed to and ones which we potentially could adopt going forward. So uh, our architect is fairly well versed in, in, um, in uh, stormwater retention. And so to the extent that we're able to incorporate that into the design, we'd be happy to do that. I know at a minimum, we of course have already discussed the green roof, which is something which um, uh, we've included on, on um, previous building plans and we, we'd be happy to do that. To the extent that the council wants us to further explore that and perhaps submit uh, a revised design with, attention, with additional um, uh, stormwater retention or other environmentally sensitive measures, I think that's something we'd be happy to do. Okay. so. A lot of questions about about a MIH and the bands and stormwater retention and the Vision Zero piece. Sure. Your job, your burden here is to prove to us that you're going to memorialize this as we move forward. 
if that doesn't happen, we won't move forward. And that's just the, the, the clear statement that I want to make in this public hearing as we move forward. Um, you're unlocking incredible potential here on, on the financing and value. And the public deserves to hear and see and feel that you're going to meet that, that commitment. That's on you. Sure. And we're waiting to hear some of that. So let's just keep talking. We're going to talk to DOT about the improvements in the corner. And, and Chair, I'll come back to you and the committee to, to let you know that we feel good, that there will be memorialized opportunities. Let's be creative, as, as creative as we need to be. But if, if you fail that, that piece, this does not move forward. There's a lot of good work that's come to this and a lot of good engagement on the ground. And I want to honor all that, but that means nothing after we pass this and give you that ability to unlock the power of this project. So looking forward to more conversations, but that is, that, is, that is your homework, that is the work. Let's work together to make that happen. Council member, we understand that. We thank you for your recommendations. The, um, the particularities of the timing here resulted in a city planning approval uh, last week and a, and a very short window to this subcommittee meeting. So we look forward in the, in the additional time until the vote to uh, work further with your office and you and the council to come up with a mutual understanding. We love the fact that the community board was unanimous in their support, and we wanna do something that's productive for um, both the area and for this site. So we thank you again for your comments and we're happy to comply. I just wanna go back to something you said. Um, you said MIH option one. Correct. 40%, you said 5% at 40. Yeah, I think that the, the, as far as the bands are concerned, that there would be a, there, that of the, um, of the 25%, 5% is at 40% AMI. So. 5% um, meaning the 5% of the total project, of the total, uh, of the total units in the, in the development. Okay, because the requirement is 10% of the 40. Oh. At, at 40. 40. At 40. Yeah. I apologize. That's so my error. I just so. want to make sure if right. you were on the same page. Correct. Okay. We, we will comply with MIH requirements, and, and I misspoke. If it is 10%, I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This panel is dismissed, and now we will... Are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify on uh, this item? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close uh, the public hearing. I'd like to recognize uh, that we are joined by Councilmember Konstantinidis, uh, uh, Councilmember Gradenchek, Holden, uh, and Richards. So we will now uh, vote on the applications that were the subject of prior hearings. Uh, we will vote to approve LU uh, 208, the Lefferts Boulevard rezoning uh, for property located in Council Member Adams' district in Queens. Uh, this application for a zoning map amendment will facilitate a new commercial development. A C23 commercial overlay district would be established within an existing R41 district. Uh, this rezoning would extend the current uh, C23 overlay district along Lefferts Boulevard from a depth of 100 feet from Liberty uh, Avenue to a line 500 feet north from 107th Ave. Uh, Council Member Adams is in support of this application uh, and we will now move. Oh, we will also uh, uh, vote to approve LU's uh, 216, uh, the 180 uh, Myrtle Avenue text amendment application submitted by uh, Red Apple Real Estate regarding uh, ground floor use regulations within the special downtown Brooklyn district. Uh, the proposed zoning text would allow all non-residential uh, uses permitted by the underlying zoning district within the required special ground floor use for buildings fronting on Myrtle Avenue between Ashland Place and Fleet Place in Majority Leader Council Member, uh, in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. Uh, she is in support of this application. Uh, LU's Sorry, we're gonna <laughs> skip through that and. Okay, so LU's 209 through uh, 213, the 2632 Jackson Avenue and 2701 Jackson Avenue 
uh, applications for property and council member Van Bramer's district in Queens uh, will be laid over. Uh, I will now uh, call for a vote to approve LUs 206 and 216. Council, please call the roll. Sorry, minor correction, to approve LUs 208 and 216. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Chair Moya. Aye and all. Constantinides. Aye and all. Levin. Aye and all. Richards. Aye and all. Grudenchik. The land use items are approved, um, and actually we see Council Member Rivera. Are you ready? You ready to vote? <laughs> Rivera. Aye on all. The land use items are approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, no negative, and no abstentions, and we will leave the vote open. Uh, our next hearing will be on uh, pre-considered LU's uh, Varsity Boys and Girls Club of Queens rezoning for property in Council Member Constantinidis' district in Queens. Uh, the applicant is seeking a zoning map change from uh, R7A and R6B to a R7X and a zoning text amendment to apply uh, MIH to the rezoning areas. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of a new residential building and a community facility. The residential building would reach a maximum height of 150 feet and would include approximately uh, 112 units, uh, of which approximately 34 would be affordable under MIH option two. The community facility building would front on 30th Road and a house and house a new space for the Varsity uh, Boys and Girls Club, including a new swimming pool and basketball court. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I call up Matt uh, Troy and Richard Bass. Yep, thank you. One second. Uh, I ask now the council to uh, please swear in the panel. Uh, before responding, each please state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all questions truthfully? Yeah, please state your name before you begin. Thank you. So before, before we begin, I want to turn it over to Councilmember Constantinidis for uh, some remarks. No? no? <laughs> Perfect. You may begin. <laughs> Now, now can you hear me? Good morning. Uh, One second, if I could just get my colleagues to please. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Grudenchik. Begin. Okay, good morning, I'm Richard Bass. I'm with the law firm Ackerman LLP. I'm here today with Matt Troy, who's the executive director of the Variety Boys and Girls Club. We're seeking a, uh, two actions uh, in terms of the amendment to the New York City zoning resolution a map change from R7A uh, C23 and R6 to R7X for the entire site. Uh, we're also seeking uh, an amendment to Appendix uh, F uh, to map the area as a MIH area. Uh, the site is on 21st Street between 30th Road and 30th Drive. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, the existing conditions. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club has been at this site for 63 years, um, and we'll explain why we're here today. But as you can see from these pictures, uh, it's not exactly uh, pedestrian urban friendly. Uh, this is facing it on, on 21st Street. It's basically a hole in the urban environment. Here is a summary of the actions that we're seeking. Uh, 
Again, it's a map change to R7X and MIH mapping. Here's the zoning map that shows the area, a tax map that shows the zoning lot. Uh, currently, there's a senior facility on the zoning lot. It will remain as an affordable senior facility. It's also owned by the Variety Boys and Girls Club. Again, the zoning uh, map change. The action will result in, in two, uh, two buildings. Uh, one will be a 14-story, uh, 112 residential uh, units with ground floor retail. Uh, 37 of the units will be affordable. It also will result in the re uh, redevelopment of the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, many of the council, uh, many elected officials I've met uh, in this process learned uh, how to swim at this, uh, this club. It's well loved. Uh, part of the issue of why we're seeking uh, its expansion is that it's oversubscribed. Uh, uh, Matt will describe how many children are being turned away from the, the club because uh, there's not enough capacity. This shows uh, the model of how it would fit in the neighborhood. Um, we've designed the building so that it matches the base of the uh, senior facility uh, to the south. And as it sets back, the upper floors will be glazed so that the building will feel lighter in, in, in its massing. Here's a site plan of the, of the, uh, of the, the proposal. The residential building will be on 21st Street. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club will be on, on, on 30th Road. Here are some elevations showing the Boys and Girls Club on the left and the proposed residential building. Again, you can see at the setback, the building goes from masonry to glass. This is the elevation from 21st Street. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and, and we'll describe the, the, the program. All right. Good morning, Chair Moya, members of the Zoning Committee. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak about our project. This is a very exciting time for our organization, a long time in the coming. Uh, my name is Matthew Troy. I'm the Executive Director of the Variety Boys and Girls Club. I live in Astoria. Uh, my family has lived just up the street from our club for the past 40 years. This community means a lot to me. Um, I believe this project is going to transform our neighborhood and serve as a resource for all families for generations to come. We are designing this Boys and Girls Club to be the center for high quality children's programming. Um, today the families of 1,700 local children uh, rely on our club. As you can see from this map, um, something that makes us unique is that we serve families from all walks of life. Uh, Storia has such great diversity, but it's community centers like ours uh, where inclusion happens. Uh, we create an environment that brings children together. Our mission is to serve all families, especially those who need us most. Uh, that is why since I joined the organization three years ago, I've helped to more than double our budget, thanks in large part to support from Councilmember Konstantinides. Um, in return, we've been able to lower fees for our most popular program after school at the club uh, to zero, completely free. We're very proud about that. Um, today our club features a technology makerspace that connects local professionals in the tech industry to collaborate with our kids. We offer a digital 3D architecture class in partnership with Skanska, the same engineers who are rebuilding LaGuardia Airport. JetBlue has awarded our club with a major gift to launch JetBlue science hubs at each of our sites. Um, we have a teaching kitchen. Uh, our kids learn gourmet cooking and healthy eating. And on Fridays, they are offered two free bags of fruits and vegetables uh, to take home with their families using the same ingredients they learned to cook with that week. Uh, we have a media production studio. Our kids just produce enough films to host their own film festival. We called it the Variety International Film Festival. And we had professional filmmakers, 30 of them from across the country, uh, come to our club to showcase their work alongside of our kids. Um, on weekends, our club is packed with children who attend our Learn to Swim classes. Our pool is where generations of children have learned to swim. Uh, former speaker Peter Vallone Sr. actually worked as a lifeguard in our pool. Um, I believe to survive and thrive in the 21st century, um, our children need the experiences that only our Boys and Girls Club can provide. Um, and some of you may be thinking, this sounds great, sign me up. Uh, well, it turns out you're not alone. Uh, last year, we had 642 children on our wait list um, for our core programs who we were not able to serve due to space limitations. 
Um, we really need this new Boys and Girls Club to help grow our capacity by doubling the number of children that we can serve, to provide state-of-the-art uh, classrooms uh, to really take the programs I mentioned to the next level, um, and to operate a facility with 21st century safety, environmental, and accessibility standards. Uh, to sum up, we are a community center, and we bring together the best of Queens to give children the opportunity to reach their full potential in life. We need this project to continue with our mission. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions before I, I turn it over to Councilmember Constantinides. Uh, is there a reason you chose MIH option two? We uh, chose that in consultation with the council member. I believe that um, we are open to option one and two, if, if that's what the, the council member would like. Okay. Um, Will the affordable units be located throughout the building? Yes, of course, in, in compliance with uh, uh, HPD regulations. Right. And I know that the community board had made a request. Uh, will this building charge fees uh, for any of the building amenities? The residents of yeah. the building? Um, to use to, the amenities. For the residents to use the facilities yes. of the boys? I, I don't know if we have an answer on that, but um, they would have access to a swimming pool in close proximity. I think that's to be worked out with the developer. Okay. Uh, and also, is there a commitment to good jobs on this project? Of course. Um, it's going to be a 421A project uh, so that it will have to uh, comply with prevailing wages. Okay. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Council Member Constantinidis. Do you have any questions? Thank you. So, so what, talk about some of the partnerships that you have with soccer, baseball. I know there's a lot of different programs that are there currently that you're hoping to expand and grow with the uh, creation of the new building and the expansion of the club. Sure. Um, I think one of the things that sets us apart that we really do uh, very well with is we bring different organizations together. Um, our makerspace program that I mentioned, it partners with um, local tech entrepreneurs, people in the startup industry who live in Astoria who come work with our kids. Um, Samsung is another corporation we work closely with. They featured our STEM programs in a national campaign recently, which we were very proud about. Um, these are the experiences that give kids an opportunity to work with professionals in the field. Um, they're not going to get these experiences in school and likely not in their home lives. Um, if you remember growing up, some of those experiences you had seeing what uh, professionals do in their field uh, sometimes inspire kids. Uh, we have a great program with this organization, uh, BioBus. Uh, they bring in PhD level scientists to do, uh, honestly, real world experiments with our kids. Um, I can't tell you how many kids after tell us they want to be scientists. Um, we help them to discover their passions. Um, and we are doing as much as possible with the very limited, very old space that we currently have. Um, but if we could get this new space, which we absolutely need, um, we could take these programs to the next level. And that's what we're hoping to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, just uh, quickly want to pause to open up the uh, vote. We have Council Member Reynoso here. Continuation of vote to approve Lynn's items 208 and 216. Reynoso. I vote aye on all. The land use items are approved by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions and referred to the full land use committee. Okay, are there uh, any other members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Our uh, next hearing will be on LU's uh, 235 through 237, uh, the 69-02 Queens Boulevard rezoning uh, for property in Council Member Holden's district in Queens. Uh, the applicant seeks a zoning map amendment to change the rezoning area from uh, M11 to R R7X with a C23 commercial overlay. 
and a zoning text amendment which would apply MIH option two uh, to the rezoning area. The applicant also seeks a general large scale special permit uh, pursuant to uh, ZR section 74-743 to modify regulations <coughs> regarding maximum building height and the number of stories. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of two mixed residential and commercial buildings with 14 and 17 stories and approximately 561 dwelling units of which approximately 169 would be affordable. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and I now call up uh, Ross uh, Moskowitz, John Ignatius Bean, and Zachary Caden. Yes. Uh, and now I ask the council to uh, please swear in the panel. Before responding, please turn your mic on and state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. yes. <laughs> please, please state your name uh, into the mic and say yes. Uh, Ross Moskowitz, yes. John Ignatius Bean? Yes. Zach Caden? Yes. Uh, I now want to turn it over to Council Member Holden for uh, some remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair Moore. I, we have um, a, a few concerns. The committee board voted against the, the original project, the 29 to 1, citing concerns, um, many concerns, not only in the height, um, so did the borough president, the height of the building. Um, there was uh, upzoning in the area years ago, um, but the area behind um, this um, these buildings um, is really essentially one and two story uh, and one, in, uh, one family or two family homes. And um, as the chair knows also that our, our community school district, which he shares is, is uh, uh, District 24, is, has 5,000 seats that are unfunded. So we need 5,000 seats. Um, concerns I have uh, not only of the height and the bulk, um, but that it is at least, um, it's more than a half a mile from the nearest subway. Um, and there's uh, the Newtown, the Grand Avenue Newtown stop on the M is about a mile away. So uh, I have concerns not only with this complex, but some of the larger scale um, uh, buildings in the area. So it is getting to be a crowded area. Um, and I'm very concerned with the bulk, but we, we had talked about it. The, the school we're trying to solve, we're trying to um, talk to the applicant, and, and I know you'll, you'll mention that, um, to try to get a school in the complex. Um, but I do have some questions. Should I wait until the applicant talks, and then we'll follow through with some questions? Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member. You may begin. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Amoya, Councilmembers Subcommittee. Uh, Ross Moskowitz, Council to uh, Madison, and I'm joined by my colleague John Bean to my left and Zach Caden to my right from Madison Realty. Um, as mentioned, this is an application by Madison Realty Capital for the following land use actions uh, to facilitate the construction of two mixed residential and commercial buildings. Uh, our team is pleased to have this opportunity to present what we believe is a transformative project that will provide much needed affordable and market housing and, and public open space. As you see from your presentation, uh, we're proposing um, 169 units here, uh, a little more than 7,000 square feet of public open space, uh, almost 6,000 square feet of locally oriented retail, and we believe the project has been designed to uh, preserve access to light and air, improve uh, streetscape and, and the pedestrian experience. The actions before you, uh, as mentioned, are, are threefold. Uh, one is the uh, rezoning of the southern portion of the property from an M1-1 to an R7X uh, C23 zoning district. The uh, next action is the MIH designation for the zoning text amendment. 
uh, in this area, Community Board 2, Woodside, Queens. And the third action is a special permit pursuant to Section 74-73 to uh, modify certain height and setback requirements within a, what's known as a large-scale um, general development. Uh, the project is, is very, is a somewhat irregularly shaped, and uh, as you can see, uh, first location in Woodside, but there, as you can see, the neighborhood context. No, go to the other slide. Thank you. Um, it includes a mix of residential, industrial, manufacturing, transportation uses. Uh, the tracks uh, are uniquely, the elevated tracks for the Long Island Railroad are uniquely uh, located right behind the site. Um, and the study area is uh, really around the area is predominantly residential districts. It's uh, important to note in 2006, the city uh, rezoned dozens of blocks along Queens Boulevard and north and south of our project under the Masspeth Woodside uh, rezoning. In fact, the northern portion of our site uh, was rezoned from M1-1 uh, to its current R7XC23 designation. And in fact, all we're looking to do here is to just continue that, um, that designation. It's also important to note for the committee um, that in 2006, when this rezoning took place, uh, 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 optional inclusionary housing was placed uh, within the rezoning. Since that time, no affordable housing has been built uh, as a result of that rezoning. So I think it's very important to note that for the committee that one of the benefits of this proposal that we're seeking here is to actually uh, allow for affordable housing to be built, uh, which has not occurred again since the prior rezoning. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, this has been received as, as, as a positive, certainly from the planning perspective. Um, we're going to address Councilmember Holden's uh, comments uh, along the way, uh, Councilmember Moya. I would like to um, note um, in particular uh, in terms of the school conversation, because obviously we have been to the uh, community board, we've also been to the borough president, and the borough president, as you know, approved this with, with uh, certain conditions. And one in particular was our ability to find a solution to the overcrowding of schools, as Councilmember Holden has said. And I should note that uh, we've been working with Councilmember Holden uh, actually before he even got sworn in. So we appreciate the time and effort that Councilmember Holden and his staff have given to this project um, and, and given to us and the sincerity of the conversations and we look forward to continuing those conversations. But in particular, the, the request made at the community board as well as at the borough president was to find a solution uh, for the overcrowding. And we are working diligently um, to solve for that. Obviously, it means doing a different design, a different project. Um, we have, we are, optimistic that we will find solutions, but you know, f on the record, we are engaged with uh, multiple opportunities, um, in particular with the School Construction Authority, have met with them uh, on design uh, as recently as yesterday. So we are fully engaged with SCA. We are looking at other opportunities too, uh, other types of schools, but um, we are confident we will get to a solution. We're, we're just not there yet because this is obviously something that's been fluid and, and, and continues to evolve. But for the committee to, to appreciate th that is an effort uh, made by the applicant and, and we have uh, briefed the council member Holden and, and he is aware of those efforts. So I'd like to turn to Mr. Bean now to kind of walk you through the specifics of the asks. Thank you, Ross. And again, John Ignatius Bean um, from Strook on behalf of Madison Realty Capital. Let's get us uh, a little better sense of the site before we talk more about the actions. Some existing site photos showing uh, the area, the intersection of Queens Boulevard and 69th Street. Uh, existing uses, uh, there essentially are none at this point. Um, some low-rise uh, commercial and uh, industrial uses have historically um, been at the site of gas station and a restaurant, I believe. Um, there's also a flower shop that's relocated. Um, some more existing site photos. As you can see, um, it could use a, a little sprucing up. There's the LIRR embankment on the right in the orange photo. Um, Here's some existing photos of nearby development. As you can see, although, uh, as Council Member Holden pointed out, there is low-rise development both north and south of Queens Boulevard, there's quite a lot of higher and medium density uh, development along Queens Boulevard. Um, and I think city planning has recognized routinely that wider streets uh, are appropriate for higher density development. Um, so the nine-story building on the far right is the the uh, market only development that's going up on our block. Um, I think it's moved along since then. So um, Ross mentioned that we're seeking a special permit uh, for certain height waivers. Um, we do this uh, sort of out of necessity um, and it's all based on the uniqueness of our site. Um, now it's a large site um, and the first thing you'll notice is that it has frontages 
on all four blocks, but it actually, even though it's over 75% of the lot in terms of lot area, it only has uh, about 40% of the frontages. Um, and so when you combine that with the mandatory street walls that are required in the R7X, um, you end up pulling all of the massing to the corners. Um, and when you do that, you, um, you, you reduce the amount of lot area that you can use. Um, and so in addition to that, we have the LI double R embankment, which requires its own setback. And we'll talk a little bit about how we've addressed that in the design. Um, but but the, the point is we've, we've got a fairly constrained footprint and the only way to fit all of the 6.0 FAR that we're getting uh, with the rezoning is to go up and to go up beyond uh, the height limitations. Um, at city planning, we actually studied and showed city planning what it would look like if we did not have the height waivers, and I'll get to that, but let's just talk about what we're asking for. Um, so on the West Building, which is important to note that it, it's along Queens Boulevard, a very wide boulevard, and along the LIRR, which is effectively open space. We're asking for 17 stories, uh, where 140 is permitted under the R7X for an MIH project. And then we're not asking for relief on the stories on the East Building, um, but we are asking for a little bit of height, 11, 11 feet, six inches. Um, and so, again, I, I mentioned that we studied at city planning, um, our architects extensively examined what it would be like to normalize the heights and not be seeking waivers. Uh, and what we came up with were two 13-story buildings that were deeper, but lost 86 dwelling units and 20, I believe 29 affordable units. The fact is it actually reduced the open space and didn't add any dwelling I'm sorry, units. Can you either. just say that again? Yes. That you lost how many affordable units? Well, essentially you lopped off the tops of the buildings and you put all the bulk in the back. Um, if you can imagine where the central area is, that's where the open space is. So we re it reduced open space by about 7,000 square feet. It didn't increase any of the number of apartments. It simply made them longer and narrower um, and inefficient uh, sort of from an architectural perspective, not even necessarily gaining any bedrooms or, uh, or usable livable spaces, perhaps um, at bigger rooms, but not necessarily more bedrooms. So it just, it didn't make sense from an efficiency perspective. It also didn't make sense because, because this, this site is within an area that doesn't have a lot of open space, we work with city planning to design a site that maximized open space. Um, and so reducing open space, losing apartments, it just didn't feel like the right way to, to utilize the floor area that, that uh, was available under the R7X rezoning. And, and just to Council Member Moria, uh, the open space is the public open space we're referring to as well. So we wanted to maximize that as soon as you'll see in a moment. Right. So, and, and just moving through the project, and we can talk more about that. We'd also be happy to submit some supplemental materials if you'd like to see what those apartments look like. Um, that, that's fine. Just to get uh, a little more color on the, on the plan, that's our ground floor. You see the pedestrian walkway that connects the areas uh, near the Long Island Railroad. Currently, you have to walk underneath the embankment in order to, to cross over. The, the pedestrian space that I'm gonna show you in detail actually makes it possible to enjoy your walk from one side of the block to the other. Um, you see the, all the parking is subgrade. Our parking is uh, in accordance with the requirements um, for um, for the R7X. There's a little more color, uh, literally, on the plan. The central open space, 28,000 uh, square feet plus, um, and that's for the residents. And then the public open space is 7,336. Um, it'll, be, it'll be landscaped, it'll have benches. Uh, it'll be operated by, um, and it's owned and operated by uh, the applicant here, the owner of the building. And um, city planning is requiring a restrictive declaration to ensure that it will always be maintained. Uh, of course, it's our own property, so we have every, in, uh, every reason to maintain it without the restrictive deck. Some, render, uh, some renderings just to get a sense. Um, there's, <laughs> we've talked a lot about that embankment. There it is again. Um, and you can see th this, this solution that the architects came up with really improves the pedestrian experience around the embankment and around the site. Um, it makes it feel like an actual place you might like to live. And that's looking the other direction from 47th Avenue. As you can see, we have some stoops there. We worked with city planning and, and, and uh, local groups to try to 
reflect the, the Laurel Rise character. We, that's why we wanted to have a, a more active pedestrian experience along 47th Ave. As we'll discuss, we, uh, we anticipate that if a school works, it's gonna have entrances uh, along that side. So if you're riding the LIRR uh, into the city, this is what you would see as you, as you uh, go west and look out your, uh, the right uh, windows. Um, we're pretty proud of it. And then if you were looking west along Queens Boulevard, this is just to give a sense of the, the density that is uh, coming on Queens Boulevard. The, the buildings that are in sort of uh, shadowy form are the ones going up. Um, and that's, that's it. No, these are some metrics um, on how we are, how are the affordable breaks down. Um, we're discussing option two. And again, as uh, my colleague mentioned, 169 affordable apartments at 80% uh, weighted average. And just to add to that, Council uh, Subcommittee, uh, we have a relationship with Breaking Ground. Madison Capital has done affordable housing throughout the city, so they would be uh, the third party who would help administer the affordable housing side of this. Okay, okay. just a couple of questions before I, I turn it over to Council Member uh, Holden. Uh, I know you, you mentioned this before, but let's just walk through uh, the need for the special permit waivers again. So you're not getting additional floor area. You're just getting more height uh, and number of stories? That's correct. On one of the buildings, we're getting height and number of stories, and on the other, we're getting uh, height only. Okay. Uh, and then just uh, walk me through how you established the proposed uh, unit mix of proposed studios and one bedrooms, and why haven't you proposed more two bedroom units? Uh, and how would increasing the percentage of two bedroom units affect your project? So, to start with the unit mix, when we first contemplated this building in this area, we thought the studios and one bedrooms were the need of the community and demographic and we've had an ongoing dialogue with Holden and we understand that there is a potential need for more two bedrooms which are which we are exploring but at the same time there's architectural designs and floor plans that adding two bedrooms affect plumbings and kitch kitchens and density so we have to look at that um, the second point is right now if you look at the proportion of bedrooms for the market rate and affordable units we are meeting the proportionality test so that's how we are compliant with MIH. So the same proportion of market rate studios, about 25%, is the same for affordable. Where is that, at the, on, on the, on the last page? Yeah. So if you look at the table on the bottom left, you see studios for market, 96 of the 392 is about 25%, and the 42 studios of the 160, proposed 169 affordable are 25%. So that is compliant with the proportionality test. So increasing, potentially increasing the number of two bedrooms, we would have to see how that complies with por the proportionality test, or. Right, but that's for option two. I'm, I'm, a I'm asking why you wouldn't choose a different option that would help increase the number of two bedrooms in this project. So, the, so the option two was decided based on the no, I got I that. The performer of the deal and what we felt made the most sense to make this become a reality. So I, I think, Council Member, if I could, what you're asking is would, would we consider looking at another option? We, Correct. We, we've, we've landed on option two for the reasons that Mr. Caden has said. We, we understand you, you'd like us to explain, perhaps in a follow-up to the committee, why other options are, are not where we're heading. Correct. We, we will be happy to provide that. So, and then I just just uh, one more one more question here. Uh, I know that you had talked uh, briefly about the borough president's uh, recommendation. Yeah. Um, can you just uh, you, you mentioned the school? Yes. Can you just go into the other details of her recommendations? Sure. There are that? there are there are three. The the approval was had sort of th three themes, I guess. Um, okay. One was to relook at the height. Um, and I, I think Mr. Bean has um, explained to you why the, the height is needed, but that was one thing that the, the BEP asked us to look at. Uh, 
also was a, an affordability and whether we can go deeper, which um, I think Mr. Caden has said we're, we're looking at as well. As you know, option two is um, a weighted average of 80 percent, but we have um, agreed with Councilmember Holden that we would, we would revisit that. And then the schools was the third theme, and I think, uh, I think we're pretty clear on what we're trying to do there. And has any of this come up in terms of uh, what this will create in terms of uh, traffic on Queens Boulevard since you are right there? Where sure. is the staging going to be, and has that all been discussed? Of yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, twofold. Um, we had to vet that internally, both at, uh, as you know, uh, within city planning. Yeah. Um, council knows what, what that process is like. So yes, we, we have uh, done our analysis, environmental analysis, and determined how to do the staging um, off the side streets and to obviously avoid Queens Boulevard traffic. Um, secondary, as my colleague Mr. Bean said, if indeed a school shows up, it's obviously not going to be on Queens Boulevard. It's going to be on the side street. So we've, we've determined how to do that from a safety point, a traffic point, et cetera. Um, we've, from our site plan in particular, we have figured out how to do loading the parking and not to have any, I think where you're heading, any conflicts, you know, traffic, pedestrian, vehicular. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to Council Member Holden. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, I have some of the same questions about the, the, um, the makeup of the uh, units. Um, two bedrooms, only 13.5% of the, of the complex has two bedrooms. No three bedrooms, obviously, but um, I, I, we've seen families in the area by this. It's a, the, the uh, surrounding communities. It's really a family-oriented community, um, and I don't want to see families with uh, two children, three children going into a one bedroom, which we're seeing in some areas of that in, in Woodside. And so I would actually push for, I'm not, I'm not buying that you, you can't increase, uh, some have two, more two bedroom apartments or even some three. Uh, let's get practical. Uh, people have children. Families have obviously have two children. They have to live somewhere, and this would be a good complex in the community. Um, so I would urge you to certainly get more two bedrooms, and if not, a few threes. Um, uh, just like a couple of questions to the applicant. Do you currently own that M1 property? Did you close on that property? Because you didn't own it originally in the back on 47th Avenue. We closed on lots 41 and 44 in August. You closed in August, okay. Correct. All right, and um, the the idea of and he, this is the, my concern with the bulk of the property, um, which originally uh, 560, 561 units, and to get to a subway, you really essentially have to cross Queens Boulevard, there or you you could jump on a bus, but we know what Queens Boulevard is like, um, so I'm, I'm concerned about the safety of Queens Boulevard there. It has been safer, but there's a lot of people. And, and by the way, you have, it's 0.7 miles to the subway, all uphill in the morning if you're going toward the subway. So it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, trek, especially in the winter. So I, ha I have concerns with the bulk that we need that there. And by the way, if you look at your building, 17 stories, would dwarf any building in the area. I think the committee has the packet. You can see what's going up now. We have um, it's 11 stories is the tallest building, I think, near there. Um, this would be 17 and 14, and there's a seven-story building and a nine-story residential. So it will be a shock. And so my constituents keep calling me. They're, they're against the height. They would, they would welcome the building. It's just the, the, the bulk uh, that they're concerned with. So I do have concerns. I'm not so, you know, if this has to be cut down a bit, I, I, you know, I have to listen to my constituents there. They know the area. Obviously, I know the area. Um, we know what 69th Street and Queens Boulevard looks like today. We know the traffic that's there. It's gridlocked many times. Um, so I need to, we need to see what impact this will have, um, especially 561 units um, have on the area. And I do share some of the um, um, concerns of the borough president and certainly the community board, but we'll work together. We'll fi we'll figure this out hopefully, uh, and um, 
and come up with a solution on the school also, which we desperately need. In fact, I've located a number of sites for schools, as Chair Moya uh, shares with me. We, we share that district, um, and he has his concerns, I'm sure, with the school. And um, so we're going to try to make the school work in, inside um, the complex. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I now want to call up the next panelist, uh, Zamir Khan. Push the button, just state your name and you, you can begin. Uh, good morning, my name is Zamir Khan. Uh, good morning, Chairman Moya, Council Member Holden, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Zamir Khan. I'm a concierge in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I've been a member of 32BJ for the past nine years. I've been a resident of Queens all my life, uh, the past 30 years. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service workers union in the country. Uh, we represent 85,000 workers here in New York City. We clean, maintain, and provide security services in schools, commercial, and residential buildings across all five boroughs. Many of our members work in residential buildings, like the proposed development at 6902 Queens Boulevard. We estimate that this project will likely create around 14 new building service jobs in the area. We are pleased to let you know that this developer has made a commitment to good, family sustaining jobs for Woodside families. Uh, Madison Realty has also worked to ensure good jobs and high standards for workers at other buildings in their portfolio, and they've been developing a strong relationship with us here at 32BJ. Uh, we believe that the developments that pay service workers the industry standard prevailing wage and benefits allow workers to live and work in the city that they love while they support their families, uh, 32BJ has allowed me to do that as a parent with two children. Uh, for these reasons, we urge the City Council to support this project and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, our last hearing will be on the pre-considered LU's 11-14 uh, 35th Avenue rezoning uh, for property in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens, a zoning map change for R5 to R6A with a C13 commercial overlay would be applied to portions of Block uh, 331 and an MIH area with MIH options 1 and 2 would be applied to the rezoning area. These actions would facilitate the development of a new eight-story mixed-use building with approximately 75 apartments, of which 22 would be affordable. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and I will be calling up uh, Frank. Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Frank, uh, Frank St. Jacques, uh, Najima Rivera, and Paula De Paola Duran. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Uh, I now ask the council to please swear in the panel. Um, I'm just going to ask um, the panel to submit an individual. Um, so you can't put two people on one slip. Um, before responding, please turn your mic on and state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Frank St. Jacques, Ackerman, LLP, I do. Najima Rivera, Hanek, I do. Paula Udan, Hanek, I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, as I said, I'm Frank St. Jacques. I'm with Ackerman, LLP, for the applicant, Ravi Management, LLC. Uh, we're here with respect to the 11 14 35th Avenue rezoning. Uh, this is an application for a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment. So I, I just pulled up a slide uh, showing the project loc location. Uh, the project is located in Queens Community District 1. 
It's currently zoned R5, and it has been since uh, 1961. Uh, it's within the transit zone. The rezoning area is generally bounded by 35th Avenue to the north, 36th Avenue to the south, 11th Street to the west, and 12th Street to the east. The rezoning would affect the eastern half of the block. Uh, it's outlined in red on the, on the uh, screen there, uh, and the development site is, is outlined in blue. So the rezoning uh, would, would take that eastern portion of the block, and the development site is on that northeastern corner of the block, fronting 35th Avenue and 12th Street. Uh, the surrounding streets are all wide streets, uh, and the development site is a single, about 25,000 uh, square foot tax lot. It's got 92 feet of frontage on 35th Avenue and about 275 feet of frontage on 12th. Uh, the site is, is currently uh, leased by a construction firm, and it's mostly used for, uh, um, for storage of equipment. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, the uh, rezoning area is also directly across from the NYCHA Ravenswood houses. That's a 38-acre uh, NYCHA campus, and the, the buildings are uh, six and seven stories. Uh, just shows the, the, the large R5 zoning district uh, where the project is located. Uh, these are the, the rezoning area on the tax map. And uh, this uh, slide here is, is the area map as you can see within the R5, uh, there's a, a mix of uses, um, not only residential uses, which are conforming, but a number of uh, non-conforming industrial uses. Those are uh, the, the, the uh, properties that are shaded in purple. Uh, so all the, the sites um, that are, we're proposing to be rezoned are currently non-conforming uh, industrial uses, which we would become conforming uh, with uh, this application to uh, change the, the current R5 zoning to an R6A C13. Just show you some of the, the existing conditions. Um, this is, is the site. Um, it's, it's essentially uh, in the background covered by uh, a construction fence behind the mural. Uh, in this uh, slide, the uh, development site is, is on the left and the Ravenswood houses are on the right. And then just another shot of the, the development site. So as I mentioned, the application proposes two actions, a uh, zoning map amendment to establish an R6A C13 district, uh, replacing the, the current R5 zoning district, and a zoning text amendment uh, to Appendix F to establish an MIH area uh, with the same boundaries as the, uh, the rezoning area. We proposed option two, and I'll get into the details of that in a moment. The project proposed, uh, or sorry, the, the proposed actions would facilitate the development of an eight-story mixed-use development. Uh, the R6A permits a 3.6 uh, maximum FAR, and the project is approximately 3.6 FAR. Uh, that results in approximately 87,000 square feet, uh, a building of 87,000 square feet, uh, with approximately 14,000 uh, square feet of ground floor commercial space. The C13 permits use group six, uh, so that that commercial space would be occupied by uh, most likely uh, retail uses. Um, there hasn't been a tenant identified yet uh, for the site. Um, the balance of the building, about 73,000 square feet, would be residential. And that includes uh, 74 dwelling units, uh, of which uh, 22 would be permanently affordable under the mandatory inclusionary housing program. The building form itself uh, is on a four-story base that rises to 45 feet above setbacks. Uh, the, the total building height uh, rises to eight stories, and that's 85 feet. The building includes 71 parking spaces. Uh, the bulk of those would be in a cellar parking garage with 15 located at grade. I'll just skip to the next slide, which is a site plan. Uh, you can see that the massing of the building is, is uh, situated at the corner uh, of, of the two wide streets, uh, 12th Street and 35th Avenue. Uh, and then the uh, entrance to the parking and the at grade parking spaces are located uh, towards the interior of the block to the south uh, along 12th Street. There'll be a curb cut there to access the parking. Um, the building itself, uh, as you can see in the rendering here, 
uh, is, is articulated uh, and uses uh, different facade materials to break up the massing. Uh, it's also um, the, the ground floor commercial space uh, will use glazing to activate the pedestrian experience um, and, and enliven the street. There's really no uh, street wall um, along, uh, along either, either street frontage with the, uh, the existing development. So the hope here is, is to bring some life to the street. Um, the applicant uh, has selected MIH option two. Uh, that's 30% of the residential floor area at an average of 80% AMI. This was initially contemplated as 10% uh, at 60% AMI, 10% at 80% AMI, and 10% at 100% AMI. Uh, we discussed this with Council Member Van Bramer uh, yesterday uh, and have agreed to, uh, to shift, the, to basically to eliminate the income band at 100% uh, and bring the affordability down to 10% um, at 80% AMI and 20% at 60% AMI. Uh, which, which ultimately results in a, a, um, a, a lower uh, average Say, AMI. Repeat that one more time. Sure. So, so the applicant uh, has uh, agreed to uh, change the, the, um, the AMI mix from t uh, to 20% uh, at 60% AMI and 10% at 80% AMI. So that's still 30% uh, uh, affordable just with lower um, the, the lower AMI uh, than as initially proposed. Uh, and that's, uh, again, uh, 22 uh, permanently affordable units. Um, and that's, that's really, and we've also, uh, Hanek is here. We've selected uh, Hanek to be the uh, administer for the MIH program. Uh, they can speak about their presence uh, in the neighborhood, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Good morning. My name is Paula Duran, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Najima Rivera. I'm the director, <coughs> the director of housing for Hanek, and she's the director of property management. Um, Hanek is a nonprofit organization. It was founded in 1972, and we provide a variety of services, including uh, social services for seniors, children, youth, and we also provide affordable housing. Um, we have we own and developed a. Uh, over 400 units in Astoria and in Corona. All of the, our portfolio is located in Queens. And we have under construction another project in Flushing, um, and that will add about 232 units uh, for low-income seniors and families uh, on, of the city. Hanak is fully committed with the development of affordable housing, and we support any efforts towards that goal. Reason why we will be working with uh, the developer, Ravi Management, in order to act as the managing agent for the MIH units uh, that have been pr uh, proposed for this uh, development site. So HANAC will be working with revenue management in two ways. Uh, the first uh, portion will be towards the marketing of the MIH units uh, by developing the community outreach strategy with the developer, working with the city agencies to ensure that all the requirements are met for these units. Uh, that includes working with entering the paper applications for the Housing Connect portal, working with the lottery log, interviewing the possible tenants until lease up. And um, Hanak has been working in Queens for decades. And actually, as it, uh, it was mentioned by Frank, uh, across the street is the NYCHA Ravenswood Houses, and Hanak actually operates the senior center that is located within the NYCHA complex, and we also run the after-school program that is located at the same uh, NYCHA buildings. So we are very familiar with the area, and uh, we support this application because it, it is bringing the MIH units to the uh, community. And Najima is going to talk a little bit more about the managing itself of the unit. Hello. Um, as Paula, Paula um, stated, um, Hanek will be the um, act, acting as the managing agent for Ravi Management, um, ensuring that the project compliance, there's consistent project compliance from the beginning. We will be providing uh, marketing services, leasing up, initial move-in process. Um, throughout the year, we'll be side-by-side -side with Ravi Management and ensuring uh, yearly compliance 
um, making sure that the MIH units are sustaining and the units and the tenants within the units are, um, are, uh, <laughs> sorry, are um, within the a AMH, AMI guidelines. Um, throughout the year, HANEC will be the liaison between robbery management and the city agencies. Um, like I said, monitoring and conducting annual recertifications, move outs, move ins, annual reporting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, just uh, that everyone done? We're all set. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, so, I know that you said that you had talked to the council member and you have agreed to option two. Is that correct? That's correct. So, because community board had requested that uh, you use MIH option one. And I'm just uh, wondering what. So the, um, the the community board had, had asked for option one, uh, and and through discussion with with the council member, we're actually providing close to what the the community board has asked for. Their their recommendation was for thirty percent at sixty percent AMI, so we're achieving actually uh, twenty percent at sixty uh, percent AMI. The ten percent at eighty percent AMI is is um, is also included. So we're. We're providing uh, more affordable units. Um, it's it's a small building, uh, and and that's that's the, the the mix that can still sustain the development of this building. It's also going to provide uh, uh, jobs with in terms of the uh, the commercial component, and the um, the applicant has agreed to to work with 32 BJ to provide um, prevailing wage job wage jobs for the the building uh, the, the building jobs themselves. Uh, also, the I know you mentioned that right now it's uh, used as storage, but that rezoning area uh, includes uh, light industrial. Uh, is there a, a, a business or businesses right now that are operating in that space? In in the development space, there's a uh, a construction firm that's that's leasing the space. Okay. There's a um, sort of a, a smallish uh, warehouse building. Uh, but then it's the majority there is is um, uh, storage, I believe, for for crane equipment. Um, so that that uh, business, I'm I'm not. We can report back on what will happen. No, uh, I just wanted to know what would what was being utilized at that. Uh, it's site it's just a, a, a small area. construction firm. Okay. Um, okay. And is this building uh, charging any? Uh, fees for amenities? Uh, that I, I don't know offhand, um, but we can have that discussion with, with the applicant. Uh, I, I don't think that's been determined yet. Okay. If, if you can, just would love to follow up on that. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm calling up the next uh, panelist. It's uh, Panos Kutris. Good morning. Good afternoon, actually. It's Kutris. <laughs> Just push the button. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you say it? It's Kutris. Kutris. Yeah. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I, I just I just couldn't read the it's handwriting. Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, it's fine. Good afternoon, Chair Moya. Uh, my name is Panos Kutris, uh, and I'm a Queens resident and have been a member of 32BJ for two years. I'm speaking today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 1114 35th Avenue. It is our estimation that when open, this building will be staffed by approximately five building service workers. Ra a Ravi Management LLC has committed that these jobs will be good jobs with family sustaining wages and benefits. These are the types of jobs that give New Yorkers dignity and access to mobility. Ravi Management LLC is a responsible developer 
whose commitment to good jobs and affordable housing will help uplift working families in Queens. We urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, I now move to close uh, the public hearing on this uh, application. And, and the application will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course, as always, uh, our council and land use staff for all that they do. Uh, thank you again. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>